Hi folks, in this video we discuss the formal proof rules for identity. You're finally going to be done. You've learned the proof rules for all of the quantifiers and this is the last symbol. You now have the complete system of first order logic. Remember, identity is not just another bit of our language. It's one of the key logical systems that is built in. It is hardwired into our system and that's why it needs its own proof rules. These rules are also fairly easy, so that's why I've left them till last. That they're basically the way you've been using identity your whole life since elementary school or middle school or, or ever since you've been doing algebra, you've been reasoning like this. So let me just explain how they work. Identity intro, like all of our intro rules, explains how to use that symbol or how to introduce that symbol, how to write a new sentence with that symbol. And remember, this is a logical truth. Every object is the same as itself. So this follows from anything. Basically, anytime, anywhere in a formal proof that you need one of these identities, like A equals A or B equals B, you're allowed to assert it. And this is one of those unique rules like REIT that does not require any previous justification because this literally follows from no premises at all. It's a logical truth or it's a, it's a first order of validity. It follows immediately. You don't need to know anything else in order to know this. So it does not need a, a line number justification just like REIT. It's one of the few rules that is like that. Uh, and you can do it for any name. The only requirement is you have to put the same name on both sides of the identity. You can't just assert A equals B out of thin air. That's not a logical truth. But A equals A, B equals B, C equals C, etc. You can always do those sorts of things. And you can do it as many times as you want. Identity elim, that's how you use a symbol when you already have an identity sentence. How do you use it? Well, let's say we know, for example, that A and B are two names for the same object, A equals B. What that means is anywhere you have an A, you can put a B, and anywhere you have a B, you can put an A. You can use this in either direction. So let's say we also know that A has property P. Well, since A and B are the same thing, B has to have property P. And so we just substitute. This is sometimes called a substitution rule. We substitute the B in for the A, and that's how we get P of B. And when you do this, you always have to cite exactly two things. You have to cite the identity sentence you're eliminating or using, and you have to cite the lines of that sentence and the one in which you're putting it. I call this the, the destination, the, the argument place where we're doing the substitution into. You have to cite whatever line number that formula occurs on. Now, the identity elim rule is more complicated than the identity intro because it has a lot of additional cases. You're allowed to do, it's a very flexible rule. For example, let me give you some examples. Well, what if the identity, what if the A letter appeared in multiple argument places in the same formula? You're allowed to do one or more substitutions. Any of them are valid, of course. Since these are two names for the same object, you can put in B for one of the A's or all of the A's or whatever you want. So if we have lines five and six like this, you could substitute in the B for both of those at once, because again, that only requires citing two things. When you do this, what you're not allowed to do is use multiple identity sentences at once and, and cite all of them at once. You have to do them one step at a time. But when you do that, this, see, this only requires citing two things because it's multiple argument places in a single formula and we're only using one identity symbol. Uh, so I could have done both of the Bs or I could have done one of the Bs. Either one of these are valid. And like I said previously, you can go in the opposite direction. Like, let's say that I had a different sentence on line six. What if my sentence on line six had B in it, but not A's in it? Well, I'm allowed to use, whenever I have a B, I can put an A. So I'm gonna put an A in for these, and I would just cite lines five and six. That's also legitimate. Okay, now that you understand these rules, let's see if you can put it into practice. Here's a complex formal proof. Pause your videos and see if you can and fill this out for me. Okay, that was your chance to pause your videos. Now, what do I notice when I look at this proof? The first thing I notice is I've got a universal quantifier up here, so I'm going to have to instantiate this for something. I also notice I have a wide scope negation in my conclusion, and I jumped on that first. I said, okay, I'm going to do a reductio. I'm going to assume the opposite of that, and then I'm going to prove a contradiction. And notice what happens when I assume the opposite of that. I get a wide scope identity sentence, so I'm going to be able to do some substitutions like we did previously. Now, the substitution I decided to do was I decided to substitute uh, A in for this B. So I used lines three and four in order to get Q of A. That is not the only way you could have done this. You could have also done it the other way and put a B in for here. So there's multiple equally good ways that would have taken the same number of lines to do this. There's not just one way. Now, after I got that line Q of, B, Q of A, I realized I need to put those together because I looked at the structure of this thing. 
You could have brought the universal quantifier down next if you wanted. So there's, again, there's multiple orders in which you could have done this. I built the conjunction first, then I brought the universal quantifier down, or instantiated it, I mean, and you could have reversed the order of those, no problem. So once I have that, notice I've got some sentence, and I've got that exact same sentence with a negation sign in front of it. So that's the basis of my contradiction symbol. Now, how did I know I wanted a contradiction symbol there? Because I assumed the opposite of my conclusion. I knew I was doing a reductio all along. So that's what allowed me to finish off the proof with negation intro. Again, this, this proof will probably have taken you nine lines, but there are many different orders in which you could have done these things. And you could have gone with B. You could have instantiated the universal for B as well if you would have done that, that substitution in the other order, in the other way, and gone for P and B. So there's many ways of, of doing this that all would have gotten you nine lines. Now, what I want you to tell me though is, I'm gonna give you an alternative and you tell me if it's good or not. So here's another version of that proof with a slightly different order and a slightly different plan. Pause your videos and tell me, where does this proof go wrong? Does it go wrong on lines one through nine or does it go wrong nowhere and it's actually correct? So pause your videos and see if you can assess this proof. Okay, let's talk about the answer. Now, this is sort of a tricky question. Um, I'm thinking a lot of people said this proof goes wrong and it goes wrong on line four. But in fact, that is not right. It does not go wrong. It is a perfectly good proof. All of the lines of this thing check out. So why is that? I said before that you could have done this with B instead of A. And so that's not the problem. Instantiating this universal for the letter B is not the problem. What I think people really would have been skeptical about as I told you, remember, universals before existentials. Because you might think it's bad if the letter B appears outside of this subproof, because there's, that's somehow problematic. But that's not bad in this case, because we are not boxing a constant. There are no arbitrary constants here. Universals are used before existentials, yes, but there's no existential. We're not using an existential here. There are no box constants here. Look, the name B already appears outside this subproof. So there's no problem instantiating the universal quantifier first. Similarly, I could have done this order of the operations and done it with A as well. So there are many different good ways of doing this in nine steps. This is not the problem. Let me give you the contrast, why, what I think people had in mind if you said line four was the problem. I think you have in mind something like this, where we actually have universals and existential quantifiers. And there, if we instantiate the universal quantifier first, whether it's for the name B or for the name A, we cannot then box that constant on the following line in order to use the existential. This plan is bad. This is not going to be valid because now A is no longer completely arbitrary. It appears outside that subproof and that can lead to invalid inferences. So this violates our rule. You cannot do this. And so that's the sense in which instantiating the universal quantifier first is a bad thing because you're also using an existential quantifier or you're also having to box the constant for some reason and it's going to be that name. So if I did instantiate the universal for A here and I wanted to box a constant correctly, I would have had to use B. And in that case, if I'm using B, then line three is garbage. It's irrelevant because I'm gonna have to instantiate the universal for B later on inside the subproof. So that would have just been a wasted step. So in this sense, doing the universal first was the problem. But over here, this looks weird, but I just wanna, I wanna get you a sense, I want you to understand the nuances here. It's not weird because I'm using the universal first period. Using the universal is sometimes not a bad thing outside of a subproof, as long as it doesn't violate those rules about arbitrary constants. Okay, thanks.